Being at CPPCon has been amazing because you can directly speak with the experts. I've had conversations with Bjorn Strusep, with Sean Parent, and they're all very friendly and accessible and willing to give their opinions or advice on C++. Yeah, it's time. How do we know? Because uh, we can right. hear ourselves. That's how. Ah, we... All right. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Let's go. Welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm Dave Abrahams from Adobe. And I'm Sean Parent. Uh, we're here from Adobe Software Technology Lab. Uh, our charter is to taking a long term view of programming and to improve the code developers' right through education research, and tooling. We want to thank Laura Savino, whose excellent keynote, which I hope you all attended. Uh, uh, Laura spent many hours with Dave talking through this material, helping to pull out knowledge buried so deep we had forgotten how to explain it. Anyway, on with the show. We want to try something a little different today. Yeah, normally when one of us gives a talk, the other one is in the audience heckling him. Uh, but today we thought we'd just do that up here from the stage. So uh, let's kick off with something I know sh is really going to irritate Sean. Documentation is greater than code. This again? Are we really going to do this on stage? Wait, hear me out. You're into local reasoning, right? I am. That's why I have no raw loops and no pointers in my code. It's why I use private data members and don't write thousand line functions in my code. Did I mention it's about the code? But Sean, you can't do local reasoning without documentation. It's why I don't need to be a condensed matter physicist in order to program a computer. Come on, really? Really. Documentation is what keeps us from recursing down to the limits of known physics when we program. Right? We're working on a tower of abstraction that stretches through the libraries and programming language we use into the operating system below that, and then into the hardware, which ultimately rests on the laws of physics. Okay? We can use the libraries in our programming language without digging into their implementations because there's a solid spec. The compiler backend engineers can do their jobs because the hardware manufacturers document the architectures and instruction sets. And the hardware developers succeed because the physicists document the laws of physics. That's the tower, and you're a part of it. Phew. That's a lot of hyperbole, Dave. Do we pay to come up with this stuff? I get paid to ship products, not write documentation. I'm the algorithms guy, and this is a better code talk, so I'm here to help people write better code. My product is at the top of the tower, so most of my code doesn't need docs. And uh, how big is Photoshop again? About 50 million lines. That's one big single story broke down palace. Can okay. you find the bathroom in there? OK, point taken. I'm sure more than one engineer has gotten lost in those hallways. The bad news, Sean, is that you're not at the top of the tower. Someone else, or future you, is going to have to build on the code that you're writing. Everything is an API to somebody. I wrote some of that code 30 years ago. I am the future me. And I'm still not convinced. I see. I'm going to have to prove it to you. So let's just move on. The truth shall be revealed. Before we get into the nitty gritty, we'd better tell the folks what contracts are and where they came from. Sean, I learned the origin story from you. The core ideas were first proposed by Tony Hoare in 1969 as part of his work on proving program correctness. He used this notation to mean if we know precondition P is true, then executing C makes most postcondition Q true. That's called a Hoare triple. For a simple example, if at some point in the program we know x is greater than 0 and it won't overflow, then assigning x plus 1 to y leaves y greater than 1. Hoare also gave us rules 
for using these triples to reason about programs. This rule, for example, says if we know that when P holds, executing S makes Q true. And if Q, true, Q is true, executing T makes R true. So if P is true, executing S, then T makes R true. So that's just the everyday reasoning we apply to reasoning about code, right? Exactly. It's just the normal stuff of programming formalized so Tony Hora could use it to write proofs. But Hoare wasn't just interested in mathematical soundness. He wanted proving correctness to be practical. In 1972, he discovered that program proofs were a lot easier to write if you could first show that data structures were correct. So what's a data structure? It's just data that satisfies certain properties, the way a standard set is always sorted. Hoare found that first proving class invariance made his proofs of programming much smaller and more digestible. Fortunately, what makes proofs practical also makes reasoning about code practical for the rest of us. And recognizing that, in the mid-1980s, Bertrand Meyer took Hoare logic and shaped it into a software engineering discipline that he called design by contract. Now, Meyer des describes contracts as the precise specification of obligations between software components. So they're just the rules about how one piece of code interacts with another. That's it. Now, the basics come straight from Hoare, but Meyer sort of takes a, has a different take on it. He says, let's look at the component, this statement, independently from the context it's used in, and find its weakest preconditions. Now, to execute this statement, does x need to be positive? No, that condition was known from the code from which we lifted this triple, right? So a weaker form of this precondition is possible. And now, if you put this new precondition together with the operation, well, it no longer tells you that y is greater than zero, uh, greater than one, obviously. Instead, a more general postcondition follows, that y has the value x plus one. So now this triple describes the effects of that assignment statement in whatever context it's used. But this generalization is more powerful when you apply it to a named component. So let's transplant this expression into a function and call the function instead. Now the whore triple is still valid because the function does just what the expression did, right? But now we have this named declaration for which we've identified preconditions and postconditions that apply everywhere it's used. And we can say that set next has a precondition that x is less than int max. And it has a postcondition that y is x plus one. These belong to the operation. So in general, the precondition of a function is what every correct client of that function must satisfy. And the postcondition is what the implementation of the function must ensure. Right? And this legalistic viewpoint actually leads to something interesting. An ethos of blame. Now, that might sound like something you don't want in your engineering practice, but this blame applies to code, not people. And Meyer said, if preconditions are violated, well, that's a bug in the client code. Otherwise, he said, if the operation returns normally, but postconditions are violated, well, that's a bug in the implementation. How many of you have found yourself with behavior that's clearly wrong, but everybody seems to be playing by the rules and you can't decide which code to blame? Anybody? Yeah. So that's a sure sign that a contract is missing or incomplete somewhere. Finally, the part I love the most. Bertrand added a feature to his Eiffel language for expressing contracts in code as part of a class's public API. What you're looking at here describes a class interface, but not the implementation, like a C++ header file. This is the public interface for a counter class. The publicly readable feature is the value of the counter. A class invariant tells us that the value is always non-negative. The decrement method 
requires the value to be positive, a precondition. And it ensures the value has decreased by one, a postcondition. Eiffel automatically checks the contracts at runtime, which is very cool. And we can do these kinds of checks in C++ too. Oh, I, I know. Let's use a zip vector for this. Okay. I love this example because it reveals so much about contracts. A zip vector is a collection of TU pairs whose parts are stored in a vector of T and a vector of U. The storage looks like this. And the nth pair is made up out of the nth element of each vector. So this is the first pair, and this is the second, and so on. Right? You might want this data structure so you can run an algorithm over pairs when you uh, already have the parts stored in two vectors. Or maybe T or U is bool and you want to take advantage of a storage optimization. So a quick tour of the rest of the code here. There are a couple of accessors for the base data and some of the other non-mutating members you'd expect in a collection like size and empty, along with other things that we haven't shown like begin and end and the subscript operator. And then we come to the mutations, the first of which is pop back. Sean, can you show how to implement pop back with uh, contract checks? Sure. The implementation is pretty simple. Just call pop back on both vectors. But you can't pop back on an empty vector, so there should be a precondition. I'm using an old C trick to label the assert by incorporating the string literal into the condition. Now we need to write a post condition check that the size decreases by one. To do that, we have to first capture the incoming size. We're using the old if end if end debug idiom to avoid generating code for an unused old size in end debug builds. So down here, we can actually do the check. Unfortunately, we have to write these contract checks inside function bodies. But there are proposals for C26 that would lift them into the interface, like in Eiffel. The actual system is, the actual syntax is still undecided. But I can give you the general idea. Lifting our precondition into the signature might look like this. Lifting our postcondition, including the captured old size, might look like this. The captures are similar to lambda captures but they occur at the, at the start of the function while the body of the check runs at the end. Hey, Sean, that post condition is kind of weak, isn't it? I mean, popback could just scramble all of the other elements and still pass. Oh, wow, you're right. So we need to add a post condition that all the remaining elements are equal to the old elements. So we're gonna have to capture the whole zip vector and then we can compare what remains with the prefix of the old value. And this is gonna be an expensive check. Yeah. We just changed an O1 operation to an ON. That might make a linear function go quadratic. Not to mention the memory allocation, space, and locality costs. It might be reasonable to do this when you're unit testing. Now, maybe the standard library ought to have testing flags so we can write this. But that kind of spoils the value of this post condition as an interface, right? Because now it reads like it only keeps the elements stable while you're testing. Well, true. Maybe tools will learn to hide that part of the check. But this will have to do for now. Well, you realize that this check just added two new requirements on T and U. Yeah. Copy and equality. Let's flip back to the class declaration and put those in. Okay, but now we just made it impossible to put a unique pointer in your zip vector, but whatever. Ignore him. Now that we've got examples of pre and post conditions, we should specify the class invariant. The proposals I've seen don't have any way to specify class invariants, but they really should. The authors all seem to think that invariant checking is impossible, despite the existence of Eiffel since 1986. But don't worry, I'll show you how it should be done. Let's assume a syntax like this. Now, the question is, when should the language run this check? Remember, class invariants are supposed to describe 
the state of publicly observable instances. It's up to the class implementation to uphold them. So they're post conditions. Specifically, constructors need to establish the invariant, the base case. So we check after construction. Now, if the invariant is established on construction, what public operations could disturb it? Only the mutating operations, obviously, but it's not even all the mutating operations. We only need to check after the ones that directly call private mutating functions or change private data members. Any functions that only mutate through public APIs are upholding invariants by construction. Okay, back to the code. Did I mention I love code? Code is the best. Here we go. Let's implement size. Because of the invariant, we can just return the size of either vector. It doesn't matter. Now, I'm going to do a little thought experiment. Dave, imagine we didn't have this invariant. How would you implement size? Well, I, I guess we could return the minimum of the two sizes. That's kind of ugly, but it's manageable. Okay, so what about pop back? Well, let's see, I wanted to act like the zip vector has the minimum of the, of the two sizes, so maybe I would erase any extra elements at the end of one of the vectors and then do the pop back on both vectors. But this feels like it's getting out of hand. It, when I have to use similar tricks in all of the methods? Exactly. So we've just illustrated an important principle. Strong, strong contracts make code and coding simpler. Very true, but what makes a contract strong? Let's look at the parts, the ingredients. So the strength of a class invariant correlates pretty well with overall contract strength, right? A weak class invariant lets you represent more things, but you don't know much about what an object represents from its type alone, right? XML is kind of like that. Uh, it's a format built to represent anything, but then you need to rely on parsers and XSDs and DTDs to make sense of a document. A strong class invariant limits what can be represented, but in return gives the programmer a lot to lean on when working with an instance. For example, a bool is easy to understand because it only, can only have two values. A weak precondition, or no precondition, doesn't restrict how clients call a function much, whereas a strong precondition says there are more ways to misuse an API. And a weak post condition tells clients less about the result of a function, but allows more implementation strategies. And a strong post condition, of course, does the opposite. Now, based on what you see here, the chart seems to be saying that the best way to serve clients is with weak preconditions and strong post conditions. That would be an oversimplification. Take integer division, for example. It has a precondition that the divisor is non-zero because dividing by zero is meaningless. Suppose we lift that precondition, and now we need to update the post condition to account for the new input. So now we're handling the case where B was zero by returning A. Is that the right thing to do? Dividing by zero is meaningless, so who knows? But at least now the result is specified. On the other hand, the specification became more complicated. This complication is just a drag on the vast majority of developers who only do meaningful divisions, who have to mentally discard this wrinkle. And everyone reading their code has to consider the possibility of a meaningless input. Finally, it hides bugs by making unintentional meaningless divisions look just like intentional exploitation of this documented behavior. So that was an example of taking weak preconditions too far, but the same thing can happen with strong post conditions. Suppose we change the post condition of sort so that clients could predict the specific pairs of elements that would be compared and in what order. I know it's a ridiculous idea because nobody who calls sort cares about that, but that's kind of the point. How would this new pre -con post condition be expressed? seems to me we need to basically write out the entire algorithm, the exact code that would be executed. Now that's a major complication for anyone trying to understand what sort does. And it would 
also lock the implementer out of using an improved algorithm should one be discovered later. So to sum up, the contract that best serves clients is simple to understand and relevant to their use cases. Now there's an important corollary. A complex contract usually means there's something wrong with your API. I'm looking at you, Realic. Finding the right contract is a balancing act, a bit of an art, but it will inform everything from your function implementations to their names. Because you can always weaken preconditions and strengthen post conditions without breaking client code, our advice is to start conservatively. Use the strongest preconditions and weakest post conditions that maintain simplicity while supporting the use cases you are sure your clients need. This will keep you from wasting time building out features that nobody actually wants or struggling to make changes without breaking clients. So let's get back to the code. Let's look at pushback so we can store stuff in here. All right, it, it takes a pair as an argument and there's no precondition. For post conditions, the size increases by one and the last item matches the argument. The rest is unchanged. This looks a lot like what we did for popback. Same test. <clears throat> now that we have a contract, the implementation is simple. We push back first. Uh, Sean, it's worth pointing out that the invariant is broken right here. Yes. If you want to mutate things, you will have to break invariants. Temporarily. We just have to restore them before returning control to the client. Right, so if my function had a callback parameter, for example, I better not invoke it here. Yeah, it's a good idea to keep callbacks under control, but sometimes exposing a broken invariant is unavoidable. After all, in C++, the client always has a reference to the thing being mutated. <laughs> References. Here, T and U are client-supplied types. Because pushback copies its arguments, the copy constructor of U could observe zip vector with its invariance broken during the second pushback. Uh, so let's see how that works. We'll have to forward declare the copy constructor and then create a victor, uh, zip vector at global scope. And now the copy constructor can access that zip vector. And at this point, pushback will cause that baddie to be copied into the second vector while the zip vector's invariance are broken. The copy constructor reads the zip vector, and the fun begins. This probably looks ridiculous because most people wouldn't use a global this way. But if you are building networks of objects with shared pointers, you will encounter this problem. A shared pointer is as good as a global variable. So, uh, broken invariants are just a special case of a more general condition. Any given value might be meaningless if you observe it at the wrong time. Even if invariants are upheld? Yeah, even then. Most mutating functions assume they have sole access to the objects they are modifying. Those objects' intermediate values during the mutation is rarely surfaced as API. So the partially mutated state is meaningless to its client. That's why uninvited observation of an object under mutation is always a bug. Huh. Well, let's see, this is under mutation. So if that second pushback throws as written, a partially mutated state will escape. In fact, the invariants are broken, so this is serious. Okay, how are we gonna handle this case? I have a whole theory. But first I need to deliver a short rant about exceptions, because despite my best efforts, they still make lots of folks uncomfortable. Also, lots of people don't understand exceptions well. Now, I hope there's a large intersection between those two groups and that education will help, but I'm not sure. Um, so exceptions come with a very particular set of engineering trade-offs and may genuinely not be right for any given project on engineering grounds, right? Understanding those trade-offs helps a lot. But what I have to rant about is really because of this misunderstanding, you can find lots of guidelines that make a nice ringing sound in the ear, but don't help much in the brain. For example, don't use exceptions for control flow. Now, exceptions are a control flow mechanism. 
So if you're using them, that's what you're using them for. People will also tell you to stick to reporting exceptional or unexpected conditions without really defining what those terms mean. I'll tell you what the actual key to having a powerful relationship with exceptions is. It's to focus on, surprise, contracts and invariants instead of control flow. Fortunately, you've come to the right place. Sean? So what is an error? We define it. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> Back through. Presentation fail. All so, right. so what is an error? We define it as an indication that a correct function was unable to uphold its post conditions, even though it was called correctly. So errors are not bugs. For example, if you try to save a document to disk and the disk turns out to be full, you can't satisfy the post condition that there's a copy of the document on disk. Well, I might say, well then, just make having enough disk space a precondition. But usually there's no way for a client to ensure there's enough because another process can swoop in at any time and uh, use up the space. And there are other preconditions that are computationally unreasonable to demand of clients. For example, a parser shouldn't require that the client give you well-formed input because doing so is as much work for the client as the parsing itself. So for all these reasons, correct programs will sometimes be able to uphold their post conditions. And we call those situations errors. So we'll be the first to admit error is a terrible word to use here because there are so many things with the word error in them that are bugs, like programming error, syntax error, bounds error, memory error. But that's how the terms are used. When we just say error by itself, we mean there's no known, no known bug and a post condition wasn't satisfied. Okay, so here's the theory of error handling I developed back in 1998 for the C++ standard library. It says there are three useful kinds of error handling strategies. The no-throw guarantee is the strongest. It says that an operation never fails. It's called no-throw because I was working with exceptions and I haven't found a more general name that I like. But again, this applies to any kind of error handling. Now, one down from there. The strong guarantee says that if an error occurs, there are no observable effects, right? And the basic guarantee is the bare minimum requirement for all operations. It says that in case of an error, invariants are upheld and nothing leaks. The values of any mutated objects, though, are otherwise unknown. So let's run through an example of each one. So pop back is a classic no-throw operation. It's easy to tell that because the standard says that these two pop back operations are themselves no-throw and no throwness the no-throw guarantee composes. So we can actually express this guarantee with no accept in the interface, which Sean should like. Now let's look at the strong guarantee. So pushback uses two strong guarantee operations in its body, but the strong guarantee doesn't compose like no-throw. So we probably can't just let the error propagate without doing an analysis here. So if the first call throws, we know there have been no effects. That's its strong guarantee. So the error can propagate from here without exposing any effects to the client. But let's say it succeeds and the second one fails. So now the vectors are different lengths. So if the error propagates from here, we'll expose a broken invariant to clients, violating the basic guarantee. Instead, we can delay propagation of the error by using try. And now we can use the vector's pop back to restore the invariant, which we know is okay in a catch block because it's a no-throw operation, we already said. But notice this state, it happens to be the original state of the zip vector coming in. So our pushback implementation gives the strong guarantee just by doing what it takes to maintain invariance. Unfortunately, I don't know how to express this strong guarantee as a contract, 
So I guess we'll just have to rely on documentation. Sorry, Sean. Now, for the basic guarantee, the insert function is a great example. If we start by ignoring contracts and error handling, of course, it looks something like this. And it follows the usual pattern, forwarding to the two underlying vector operations, both of which give the basic guarantee. But now, because they give only the basic guarantee, either one of these inserts failing is almost certain to break invariance. Right? A failure could make arbitrary changes to the length of either vector. So there's little chance that they have the same length in that case. So getting the strong guarantee for this operation would involve making copies of the vector, inserting into the copies, and only when that succeeded, replacing the originals using a non-throwing moves assignment. And that's just too costly. So the strong guarantee is really off the table for this. I'm going to settle for upholding invariance, the basic guarantee. I just need to delay error propagation. And then I can do a brute force cleanup, clearing both vectors. That's great, Dave. But you're doing too much work here. Uh, Sean, as far as I know, I'm doing the bare minimum. I'm upholding the invariance the easiest way possible. That works, but it takes a lot of code and attention. And sometimes the only way to uphold an invariant is to weaken it. This is what happened with std variant. The committee wanted an instance to always hold a value of one of the parameter types. But when we assign a t to a variant that stores a u, we have to destroy the old stored value before constructing the new one. If that throws, there's no way to put a value back. So the committee weakened the invariant to include this valueless by exception state. As our table showed, weaker invariants make it harder for clients to reason about code. The way I do it, I keep my strong invariants and rarely think about how to clean up from an error. So look at it this way. With the basic exception guarantee, the invariant is intact. But what can a client do with the value? It's in some meaningless intermediate state between the precondition and the postcondition. If you try to do anything that depends on this value, that's a bug. So what do clients need to do to recover from this situation? Well, they do what they've always done with the basic guarantee. They arrange for the partially mutated value to be discarded. Right. And that's not too hard to do in practice, or the basic guarantee wouldn't work for people. So Dave, when you write an operation with a basic guarantee, do you mark the object so that you can detect places where the client uses the value instead of discarding it? Uh, well, now that you mention it, since using a partially mutated value is a bug, I could make not partially mutated a precondition of most operations by setting a flag. And then I could start checking all over the place to make sure it isn't set. But what would this new precondition bias? The check is new, but the precondition itself isn't new as a condition of correctness. But you make a good point. That is also doing too much work. Instead, we can find the uses of meaningless values by inspecting try-catch blocks for objects under mutation in the try block that are not discarded before use. I hope someone will write a sanitizer to help catch these mistakes. OK. So how does all of this simplify insert? Because we only have to ensure the zip vector is discardable. And it is, at each point, we can throw out all this code. We know this is OK because discardability composes an important property. And our dis Discarding operations, destruction and assignment are defaulted. Wow, if this works, it's going to eliminate quite a few try-catch try blocks. So where do we need to try-catch in the Seanverse? The picture hasn't changed much. We need try-catch when cleaning up unmanaged resources. But that's rare. Use RAII. We need try-catch for doing error reporting and recovery, same as before. Unless the type has all default 
destruction and assignment operators, we may need to catch in non-cons member functions to ensure the object is discardable. And that's going to be a little easier than restoring the invariance. One more vote for the rule of zero. Sometimes you can use try catch to give a strong guarantee, such as we did in pushback. Because a zip vector is always discardable, you can see that pushback was fine before we did the analysis. The analysis allowed us to provide a strong guarantee, but the implementation would have been correct either way. Wow, this approach makes writing correct code a lot easier. OK, but the, the previous simple invariant that the length of the vectors matched is a lie if we let this broken state leak out of our mutation, right? Now we have to update it to include this partially mutated state. No, I don't think we do. Remember, we said invariants describe the states clients can observe. That's the clients are allowed to observe. But we know only an incorrect client observes a meaningless value. Our invariant works fine. Sean, you're blowing my mind. Upholding invariants is totally baked into my way of thinking. It's the basis of all of those guarantees. This is hard for me to say, but let's update the guarantees for your system. So I guess all we need to do is update the basic guarantee to allow discardability. And I think because basic guarantee already means something, it deserves a new name. So let's call it the minimal guarantee. If an error occurs, the object is discardable and no resources leak. So now that I've convinced you to accept my theory of exceptions, let's wrap this up. I've also shown you that we can capture the essence of our types and operations directly in code without a single line of documentation. Uh, OK, Sean, can we review? Could you just show the complete interface for our, our implemented operations without any of the function bodies? Here you go. I think this tells you exactly what zip vector is about. Uh, <laughs> uh, Sean, can you help me read this? Just walk me through it. Well, actually, you know what? Never mind. Let's just focus on pushback. Can you tell me what this says in English? Well, the size increases by one. And the last element is equal to E. And the rest of the elements are the same as, the were, as they were before. OK, no, I mean, forget about the checking clauses. Just tell me what this function does. It appends E. Uh, OK. I know this isn't your jam, but would you mind terribly if I write that down? Knock yourself out, Dave. OK, so that says the same thing as the three clauses below? Yeah. Append Z implies the size grows by one element, the back element is equal to the element appended, and the remaining elements aren't changed. I said that. Uh, okay, Sean, remember when you said to me, Dave, you're doing too much work here? You were. <laughs> All right, he doesn't get it. Look, I'm trying to put myself in the shoes of someone who didn't write this code with you. Can, can you just write the English description for the rest of the API in comments like you did here? And then, you know what? Just hide the contract bodies. Fold them away. They're still there. Sure. OK, th thanks. But humor me a little longer. Now, I'm still trying to think like someone who doesn't already know what a zip vector is. Maybe I'm an intern lost in the hallways of Photoshop, and I don't know the standard library well, and I just came across this code. So I'm trying to understand what the comments mean, and I see this word element everywhere. So now, now I'm wondering, maybe this type represents the periodic table or something. I mean, I have no context for understanding words like append. Are we adding elements, discovering new elements? I don't know. I realize it's not code, but can you just add a few lines that explain what a zip vector is? If I must, but it's all there in the contracts. Uh, sure. 
Let's just take a, a minute to look at that. You know, Sean, look. It's, it's actually quite breathtaking. It's a thing of beauty. Can't you see that? Here. Ready? One or two. <laughs> One or two. Uh, one. The font's bigger. <laughs> so, we went one forward. Go forward from here? Go back one. Back one. Ah, thanks. We've, pre we've presented this as a false choice between two extremes, documentation and code. Of course, there is a balance to be found. Dave and I both agree that you should always build libraries. There are many reasons for that. Writing reusable components clarifies your thinking about the problem. Writing a library is a force multiplier. If your code is used in your product, even a great product, it will have limited scope. If your code can be leveraged in many places in your product, in all the products in your company and out into the industry, this is a force multiplier. The 10x engineer is the guy who wrote the little utility class that everyone finds indispensable. Writing correct and efficient code is a force multiplier too. It means your library will be the best solution. It will have longevity and be less of a liability. Sorry to say, but all code and documentation is a liability. Sad. If your library has excellent user-facing documentation, you will have more users, fewer questions, less incorrect usage, and fewer bugs. User documentation is a force multiplier. If you have solid internal documentation, you will be supported in maintaining your library. How many libraries do you know without internal documentation in which trying to make a change feels like a trek through a jungle? Internal documentation is also a force multiplier. It is these last two points where Dave has won his argument. I now pay attention, much more attention, to my documentation at all levels. And I'm slowly learning to write better documentation. That's a very nice thing to say, Sean. So can we just sum up by reviewing the limitations of contract checks? So we can't check everything as code. Some of these things, like strict weak ordering, are prohibitively expensive. But things like pointer validity and uh, move-only value stability, there's just no way to test them. Even in our example, zip vector, we showed checks that were only feasible for test cases, right? You couldn't use them in regular code. You wouldn't put them in a release. And we showed that we couldn't test these cases with move-only types. So I just want to say, human language is amazing. You can really see that from the one-two exercise, right? Removes the last element, captures everything about popback, including its precondition. Right? There has to be a last element. It's precise enough that you can validate the implementation and the unit tests against it. It's easy to write and think about. In the context of that class comment that describes what zip vector is, it stands on its own without a supporting example. About all I would add is a complexity bound. So I'm really trying to say you can afford to write contracts for all of your functions, public or private. And I want to point to one thing from the list. Human language can describe post conditions as changes to the inputs rather than as predicates. And that eliminates expressions that mean, and everything else has changed, which you start to see repeated over and over again and get harder to write as the operations get more complicated. We don't want to throw shade at contract checking. No. <laughs> Both Dave and I went through a time when we found it very valuable to assert all the contract checks we, pra we could practically. We still find adding checks in a fragile code base 
is a good way to gain understanding and to identify bugs so they can be fixed. I also find it useful to check conditions that might easily be broken by code transformations. For unit tests, preconditions tell you the shape of the space that needs to be tested, and checking the post condition verifies correctness. So looking back at Meyer's definition, you might notice that he says contracts are specifications, which is just a fancy word for documentation. So contracts are not a language feature, and they're not code. You might be able to express some of them in code, and you might have tooling that supports them. But spoiler alert, they're documentation. In fact, I don't review code. I review contracts. Or at least I review the contracts first. And that's most of the reviewing I do. If you ask me for a code review and there's anything without contract documentation, I'll just send it right back because there's no way to make a judgment about whether it's correct or incorrect. Right? And then if the contracts aren't well designed and specified, I'm not going to bother looking at your implementation. Remember, the contracts are the connective tissue that hold the whole application together. They're what every client interacts with and will have effects throughout the code base. The implementation, well, that's almost a detail. It had better be an expression of the contract, but that's really minimal. So I'm still going to be code reviewing your loops, uh, but thank you all for listening to our lunchtime chat. If you would like to have a conversation with us, uh, we're around for the rest of today, or better, check developer.adobe.com slash cpp and consider a career at Adobe. Thanks. Now we're happy to open it up for Q&A. I think we have microphones here and here. Thank, th thank you guys for a great talk. So I have one question that, which is the one I struggled with. I want to see your opinion on it. So what you were describing is basically, I can call an explicit contract. There is also an implicit contract, which is something I did not promise to be true as a post condition. I may have even disclaimed in the documentation that I reserve the right for, for this to not be true in the future, but it is currently true. It is probably observably to be true right now and has been, and uh, like somebody is using it, which means, yeah. yes, I reserve the right to do it, and then I'm, I'm breaking a huge code base, so now we are in this struggle with the person who you know, decided to use it. Do you have any advice for like how to detect it, how to prevent it, how, like how to deal with it in like any way at all? Like, and any help uh, in this that's, situation? That's really interesting. So you're talking about Hiram's law, right? Um, which is that uh, in a code base of sufficient size, any observable behavior of your, of your component is gonna get counted on by somebody. All I can say is, I mean, I'll let Sean answer in a sec, but all I can say is, if I let that constrain what I could do to write code, I couldn't build applications. I, I couldn't write software because the, the scalability of software depends on a network of contracts, right? So I, you know, I have to, I have to just deal with it when that happens, right? There'll be a fight, and we'll make whatever change we, we make. But in order to be able to reason locally about my code, I need to be able to think of the contracts as as really binding. John, do you have anything? Yeah, I mean. I've of course, real world situations come into play. Your vice president standing in your office saying this product has to ship, so revert that change and uh, put things back the way they were. That happens. But I will say, short story that we pulled from our slides. I have a good friend, Greg Marriott, uh, who I worked with at Apple years ago. And in the early days of the Macintosh, he wrote a little utility, which was called Even Better Bus Error. And uh, uh, some of you might have heard of it. Um, uh, it was actually a follow-on. Somebody else had written a utility called Mr. Bus Error. So this was even better bus error. And all it did is it made sure on a Mac that, that many cases of null pointer dereferences would crash. Okay. 
I think he alone was responsible for stabilizing Mac software more than any other person because now the bugs caused the application to crash, which forced people to fix them, as opposed to damaging memory, damaging the operating system. There was no memory protection on early Macs, scribbling over low memory, and dying at some point later that was very difficult to diagnose and debug. Um, now, Greg had the unfortunate position of he released this as shareware and people dropped it on their machine not knowing it was a developer tool. And for decades, he received bug reports like you wouldn't believe. Your extension causes my machine to crash, right? Uh, uh, but in retrospect, it was the best thing to do. It's, it was the best thing to break all of those apps and force them to fix their code and the entire platform was more stable because of it. So you're suggesting to intentionally sabotage people who Yeah, exactly, uh, exactly. So, so always strengthen your preconditions on every release to make sure everybody breaks. Yeah. One over there? One over hey. here. Hey, thanks a lot. Um, so basically what I'm getting from this is that writing things that are very, very accurate can be very, very daunting. And uh, human language is like not as accurate, but very like easy and, and Who said readable. human language was not as accurate? <laughs> <laughs> removes, <laughs> removes the last element. What's, what, where's the inaccuracy? Okay, so removes the last element sounds relatively accurate. And in that sense, we could, we could have like, we can, I guess, like gather all of the actual preconditions and post conditions that the mean remove less element into some like, I don't know, group, like, like a l function that, that means that or something. Or you, wanna, you wanna write it as code still. <laughs> you haven't learned anything from this, have you? <laughs> uh, maybe, I don't know. Um, so basically I'm asking whether preconditions and post conditions, first of all, because they're sort of like written gradually, at, like we, we, I guess, change our contracts as, as more users come by, I, or as, as we write our code, and, and do they compose? Like, it, could we write uh, contracts in a way that is still uh, um, like concise enough because they just are built up on top of each other or something? Right. Yeah. So, uh, uh, so correctness in general doesn't compose, which is like really unfortunate. And pre and post conditions are about correctness, and. You know, if correctness did compose, we could write a programming language within which you could only say, you could only write correct code. So, so yeah. And your it, program would always do what you intended. And your program would always do what you intended, yeah. Uh, we can't. Um, uh, 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 it's the understanding of how pre and post conditions work together that leads us to writing correct code and writing better code. And, you know, yeah, Dave wants it written in English. I actually still do want a lot of it in code, at least what's practical to express in code. And I'm somebody who sits down with Daphne, which is a formal system, and I try to prove my, my software is correct formally. Um, Last night he was just telling me how impractical this is. <laughs> you really can't read the Daphne. It, it, it is, it's incredibly impractical. If you go through with Daphne and you, you try to express, like, you know, try to say what it means for something to be sorted. Okay, and try to express that in code. You might think is sorted is enough, but it's not. It, it's the sorted values have to be a permutation of the original values. How do you say that? I can say that in English, right, very easily, right? The sorted values are a permutation of the original values. And precisely. And precisely. It's yeah, very it, difficult it, to write the code for that. It could say that the, on, the only mutations are swaps. And, and <laughs> and proof by construction, I guess, yes. <laughs> that's, a, that's a way to prove that it, may, it remains sorted, but that isn't the statement that it is sorted, right. that it is a permutation, right? So I guess, so the, remember when I said that if you're if your contract is complicated, you're probably doing something wrong with your API. You talked about the evolution of preconditions and postconditions. And 
often what's happening there is as preconditions and postconditions pile up, you're, you're making a contract that's harder and harder to describe in English with a sentence fragment, like removes the last element. If you should really be suspicious, super suspicious of any function that you can't write that sentence fragment for and have a really quite complete description, right? That's at, at that point, maybe you've got a lot of arguments, there's, there's a lot of options, it takes a lot of explaining. Look for a better API. Cool, take a question over here. Yeah, okay, so first of all, I, I think Lori sort of asked part of what I wanted to ask about, which is, can we have aliases for those things? And because aliases can give us levels of naming, right? We could have a complex expression and, but never mind, that was Ray's question. <laughs> my, my question is actually, can we move and we, I think we, we talked about abstraction layers, which is the idea that I've been also talking about in CVP now actually, but can we move between those layers of abstraction, what I think a different way to call uh, documentation and detailed contracts within our tools. Wouldn't that be awesome if we could, when the, when yeah. the developer is looking at this, they need to see this level when you want to dig in into a specific thing. So wouldn't, wouldn't that be like a really cool way to actually integrate well, that? In theory. Yeah. Yeah. In theory. Right? Yeah, I would, I would love to see both. And certainly if we had contracts in the interface, it would be easier than trying to pull asserts, you know out of your code to have a system be able to show you both. I don't think it gets rid of the need for that, yeah, yeah. for the documentation part. On the abstraction level, like I think what the question was is, is can we simplify our preconditions into like common preconditions that we can easily state? And the answer is sometimes, but some of the preconditions like where we kept ending up here are all of the remaining elements didn't change. And the problem is, all of the remaining elements changes depending on what context you're in. All of the remaining elements for insert is two ranges as opposed to one. And so you have to be able to describe that piece, which means it's very difficult to do much better than some number of calls to equal to do that test. It just, it doesn't compose. So I'll just uh, maybe, um do a bit of a push a bit farther. I was wondering, let's say I get a crash, I debug it, and I start by seeing the documentation because this is what I was trying to do, right? This is, and this is the place on which I have a problem. Then when I dig deeper into, like go into the, the stack, I get to see the contracts or other things because- No, the documentation is a contract. Right. right. It is a contract. Yeah. Remember, removes the last element makes a requirement on the client and it makes a promise to the client. Right. Okay. Yeah. So, but when but you say you get human, to see the contracts, you, want, you mean you get to see contract checks? I get to see human understandable contract at first. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And then? And then I continue. go deeper into the other stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Just yeah. a thought. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thanks. No, it would be great. But yeah. and now just, you know, keep in mind that what you've got there is a maintenance burden. Right now, you have to keep the like. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No problem. An interesting thing that I, I actually excluded to make a point in my slides is if you look at Eiffel, Eiffel actually has places within the syntax for comment blocks to describe like your class, to describe your operations, and they're syntactically there so that tools can extract those pieces, right? And yeah, Swift does the same thing with special comment syntax. It's like a standard part of the language. And yeah, please. Hi. Hi. Um, yeah, so as you were going through, through your contracts exercise, like you were going through the different steps and I was thinking, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, that, that's how I would do this. And then the moment where you threw me off was when you wrote this, this post conditions that all of the other elements stay the same. And I was like, oh yeah, what? Okay, yeah, th that makes sense. That is part of the thing. But I would, I, would never write it. I would never write that in a contract, right? 
So I, I was thinking about that as, as we're going through, and I was wondering, like, the, the documentation part is, is really good for, for expressing that, that kind of thing, right, that, uh, that describes, like, all the elements stay the same. Like, what, what, what is the, the body of the object? How does it react? But the contracts work really well for uh, describing what happens. The documentation the is the contracts. <laughs> I'm going to keep, I'm no, gonna yeah, keep stopping people when they do this. Sorry, yeah. So, sorry, yeah. I, I meant like the, 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 the contract remember, statements express. Okay, just to, just to, to explain, why I'm going to keep interrupting yeah. when this happens. Remember, we said not all of the contract is even checkable in code. Right. You can't, I fully agree. Yeah. And you can't write all of it. You can't yeah. write pointer validity. Exactly. Right? So, so the, contra the, the one contract you can actually count on that could be complete is the human language. Right. Yeah, yeah. I fully but, agree with that. Okay. So but, my, but talking about my, contract checks. My point was that for, for the machine yeah. checkable contracts, it seems to me that they work well at the surface area of, of the interface, right? Like the, the insert, the, the one element that changes, the one element that goes in or the one element that goes out in the, in the popback, that you can describe well. But what is hidden beyond that, right, like the body of the object, all of the other elements stay the same, that is where they tend not to work well and where the, the, the natural language seems to be superior. Yeah, it's, I, I wish it were somewhat that simple. I mean, th they tend to do a good job at, at asserting simple properties that can be checked in constant time are upheld. And they start to fall apart when you extend beyond that. And so, so it's not always, you know, if I'm like sorting the, a subsequence, sorting a subsequence, even though those are the things that are changing and the rest of the things are unchanged, it's actually easy to say those things are unchanged compared to saying that this subrange is sorted, right? So it, it doesn't always work out that way. It is common, but not always. Yeah, good point. Thanks. Yeah. Let's take some um, Thank you for the great talk. Uh, I guess. I also agree that the one-liner comment is more expressive, but um, I still struggle to be convinced that the documentation is contract because uh, focusing on the longevity of the code base, uh, that one-liner comment can, is easier to get out of day two. Um, so um, I guess my uh, question is, how is documentation the contract when the, that contract is difficult to enforce and check? How do you, well, yes. One question becomes, how do you know that comment went out of date, right? And, and yeah, the one thing that the, that the checks have going for them is that they're machine readable, right? Right. And so sometimes you can run them, sometimes. Sometimes. Um, uh, uh, and, you know, when you're talking about correctness, you're talking fundamentally about consistency. And, and yeah, in some sense, it's like, well, I can write unit tests, and that is basically one, another way that I can be checking post conditions of my operations. And if I have good unit tests, that's another way to check consistency of my code. Um, contract checks are a way to check consistency. But there's always the, the, there's the internal consistency, which is, works as coded, okay? And there's the external consistency, which is satisfies the specification. And it could be the specification's wrong, it could be the code's wrong, the, the problem is when they're inconsistent, right? And there isn't a good way to check that other than to read it and say, does this uphold to what this actually does? But you need them both, otherwise you can't tell when they're inconsistent. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. so is my understanding correct then that documentation could be part of the contract, but then you also agree that having a contract and some way of checking it. Well, but well let, me, uh, let me clarify a little bit more. If, you're, if your check is adding any information to what you wrote as English, that check needs to be in the documentation, right? right? That's, that is describing the, the interface of the thing. So it's not... You know, those, those, those contract checks that Sean was writing are not, not documentation. Right. They're just not very usable documentation. Yeah. They're, they're great for a machine. Not as expressive. Okay. Right? Thank you. 
So we're going to stop there. We got the sign up that says our session is over. Uh, Dave and I will be around uh, the rest of today, uh, which feels wonderful. We have been working on this slide deck through most of the conference, uh, so which is unfortunate. So I'm sorry if I haven't seen you all. Thank you for coming.